and deputy minister, both the deputy minister uh, is unfortunately, she will be at an ECD event this morning and minister of course uh, is at the presidential summit and she won't be able to join us as well. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Okay. No, thank you very much. Um, Levelin, can you then um, flight the agenda? Today we are dealing with the <clears throat> the updated status report on the um, Bella Bill. Um, written submissions um, and the oral submissions con considerations. And then after that, we are going to consider and adopt the draft uh, BRRR report. And then we've got minutes of the 18th and 25th um, of October that we also need to consider and adopt. Um, can I allow members then to um, adopt the agenda. Can we adopt the agenda, members? I suppose of, I uh, suggest that we adopt the agenda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Boshoff. Any second? Not that, I'll try a second. Thank you very much. Um, members would recall that we engaged on a process of Bella Bill, um, where we took it a decision as a committee that we need to do um, advertisements. And then we've done that on two occasions to to get um, submissions from the public. Um, the administration then will take us um, through on how many submissions we have received and what types of submissions um, we have received because we are at a stage now where we need to entertain the oral submissions which is a process we are going to start um, next week on Tuesday. Um, so I am now going to allow the content advisor to the committee, Ma'am Budem Chekwane, to take us through the, the, the process of what has happened since um, the, the issue of the, um, at, at, since the adverts were closed. And then um, we are going to take it from, from there after the presentation. Over to you, uh, Mrs. Bosch. Good morning, Honorable Chair. And good morning, members of the portfolio committee. I also extend warmest greetings to the colleagues, the stakeholders, Recording in progress. Platform. By way of introduction, my name is Paul Shambu de Munchegwane, the content advisor for the portfolio committee. Accompanying me in the presentation and the team we have worked with is our senior researcher, Mr. Kekana, our committee secretary, Ms. Delu Ellen Brown, the committee assistant, Ms. Dolim Kosana, and our unit manager, Mr. Bandi, who's providing guidance, has also joined us in the meeting. Allow me, honorable members, to share screen the presentation. <clears throat> First and foremost, what I'd like to highlight about the presentation in particular is that the draft report is a working draft. Why I'm stating that it's a working draft? It is because currently 
on an ongoing basis as colleagues we are continuously processing their written submissions as received. To outline the content, we'll go through the purpose of the report, give a background in the context, look at key aspects of the Bella Bill, the methodology and the procedures that we've applied processing the written submissions, We'll also provide the key summary observations that we looked at when we're processing the submissions. The comments which were made by public in support of the bill, comments against the bill and comments in partial support will also be clarified. Towards the end, we'll highlight key recommendations as well as close by close analysis of the written submissions, which has enabled us to come to the point of great producing this first draft report. In short, the purpose of the report is to provide an update in the processing of the Bella Bill. It also provides the committee referred to in this instance as the Basic Education Portfolio Committee with recommendations to be considered when the committee is deliberating on the bill. The report also provides the key summaries and issues which were raised, and also highlight some areas where Parliament can play its oversight role to enhance public involvement, so as to impact positively on the mandate of the participatory democracy. Honorable members, legislation can be enacted when Parliament has listened to the voices of the people of South Africa. With regards to the background and the context, this bill was introduced in Parliament on the 5th of September 2021, and subsequently it was referred to the Portfolio Committee on Basic Education for consideration. To give effect to the constitutional mandate, the committee commenced with discussion on this bill. Thereafter, an advert was publicized which called for written submissions. And this advert was published in a government gazette and all national and regional newspapers with a deadline of 15 June 2022. The 15 June 2022 deadline was further extended for the same reason that the public was given more opportunity to participate. In line with the inclusive education approach, the advert was also made accessible to the public and schools that use the Braille format. That means people who are partially sighted or who are challenged in terms of the sight or who are blind they also had to be given an opportunity to make their views heard. However, due to budget limitations, we could not print at large, but we had to take a sample of schools which were given by the DBE, as well as provide the Braille format to 45 organizations across the country. This included the main provincial libraries, the special schools, the legislatures, all nine of them have received, and the parliamentary democracy offices. To date, honorable members, approximately 18,000 written submissions have been received from members of the public. These were received electronically via email, via Google Forms, and one was hand delivered as a courier to parliament. In terms of the executive summary, this summary, in essence, tries to capture the obligation of the National Assembly in terms of the public involvement, noting that the members of the portfolio community, by virtue of their business, where they have to conduct their business and meetings in public, that this process has to involve the public. Also in line with this mandate, the committee has to decide how it will deliver these activities 
to fulfill this constitutional mandate. As it is enshrined in section 59, subsection one of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. Since we started, the Portfolio Committee has held two meetings on the PAPF and a briefing which was conducted by the Department of Basic Education. On 8th February and the 15th Feb, there were in-house engagements in terms of processing the bill which took place within the Portfolio Committee. Now, what does the bill seek to amend? The bill is looking at two pieces of legislation. The first one is the South African Schools Act, the SASA Act, 84 of 1996, as well as the Employment of Educators Act, the EEA Act of 1998. The bill then is trying to align them in terms of the developments within the education landscape so that there is effective learning and teaching in the education system, which puts in place systems that give effect to the right to basic education as it is outlined in our constitution, section 29, subsection one. Now, looking at the public interest, how did the public respond to the bill? Honorable members, this bill- Post, there is a, there is a problem, man, with your, with your connection. You keep on cutting. I'm sorry, Jay. Am I not able now? Try, right, let's see. Okay. The bill has generated some interest in the education sector. And these submissions which we received added value to the legislation, as well as this particular report which we're presenting today. The stakeholders which we can highlight that have submitted include a range of parent associations, the SGP, the educator trade unions, the principal associations, legal firms, civil society, community-based structures, and NGOs in particular. In line with the Popia Act of July 2021, as a processing team, we are to pay respect to the privacy of stakeholders because their written submissions had to be recorded and their details had to be recorded in an Excel spreadsheet so that at the end of the day, we are also in line and in tune with the Popia Act. Then the submissions as received and their recommendations remain then pivotal towards the drafting of this report. This particular slide outlines the key aspects of the bill, which amongst others include to provide that attendance of credit are compulsory. The aspect of the bill provides for systems of improvement for admission of learners. It provides for financial and public accountability frameworks. It also provides for additional regulatory powers of the minister in terms of how the decision-making and oversight powers of health departments and the executive members of the um, executive council could be enhanced. There are also clarifications of the bill as provided if members can look at the back of the MS Word presentation that we provided, from clause number one to six, we have given an appendix of all the clauses and sections of the SASA Act and the EA Act that this bill has covered. This particular slide looks at the emitting trends that have come forth. As the submissions were categorized, we then had to look at the emitting trends. There were about eight. The first one was access to basic education, followed by compulsory learning attendance, language policy issue, governance and management of public schools, budget and finance, home education, independent schools, and educators. What we did then, we formatted these in, our, in, an, in an Excel spreadsheet, whereby two additional columns also were included to ensure that 
where there are other additional questions and comments and clarification that the public is raising on any aspect of the bill or the section of the act, then such would be included on the spreadsheet and then the recommendations that the submitters have done would be included on the last column of the Excel spreadsheet. This slide, honorable members, allude to the summary findings or the key findings that we have looked at. I will not necessarily look at them in its totality, but I will also highlight the ones which I think are very crucial for the members to take note. Looking at the access to basic education, which is the first one, concerns were raised here regarding the extended powers of the HOT of this term. Um, some members of the public raised an issue on this clause, stating that this seems to give the HOD the final authority to admit a learner to, to, to a public school. In a way, it seems to centralize now the function and the powers to the HOD rather than the SGP. Now, the issue of this content is that submitters feel that this clause seems to be going against the principle of democratic governance, which is espoused in our constitution. And now what they recommend is that it is the governing body, it is the SGB that is best placed to deal with the admission of learners to a public school. HOD should be minimally involved because already they are overburdened with work that they're doing at the provincial of terms of the administrative task as head of department. On the aspect of compulsory learner attendance, again, the issue here that comes out is the fact that clause two, section three, which proposes for criminalization of parents who keep children out of school with an increased jail, jail penalty of six to 12 months. This particular aspect, some of the submitters did not welcome it. They were not happy on the issue that if parents are for example, in, in, in languishing in jail, it would mean that families are left, children are left not being at school, and it will also affect the livelihood and their incomes, leaving more children on the street, and then they would be subject to, to poverty. And also, while this bill, sorry, this clause is also looking at the issue of parents that may not have had documents, and then those are providing false documentation that also they would be facing legal consequences. Um, there was also some unhappiness in the sense that a recommendation was then crafted in terms of how this particular bill can also look into that. On the issue of the language policy, there were concerns of social cohesion, in particular, where the school governing body had to respond to determine the school's language policy. And again, on this one, the public submissions made were such that as the bill seeks to limit the governing body's power to determine a school's language policy, the views were such that this should rest with the SGP and that the requirement that the SGP must admit first the issues of admission policy, the issues of language policy to an HOT for approval, this seems to be undermining the powers of the SGP. And also, one would note that under the SASA Act, the governing bodies were provided with an opportunity to promote multilingualism. However, some had used that language policy to discriminate against other language groups with regards to school admission criteria. So in a way, if one is looking at this issue of the language policy, one must look at the balance learner. On the aspect of governance management of schools, there seems to be an articulation that says there's excessive powers conferred on the MEC, Minister and HOD by this better bill, which again, amongst others, raises an issue of concern. Further, they allude that the powers of the minister then seem to be variety, those of the SGB, when it comes to the clause that deals with the global of one or more functions of an, of an SGP. 
So this bill, this, this clause that would seek them to dissolve the SGB is a cause of concern. And once this SGB, which has been withdrawn, is now replaced by a temporary one, the argument is that to have a SGB which is granted on interim measures, it takes time to take decisions, it delays fees of um, running of a school, and therefore with any temporary measure at the school, it can mean that decisive decision making can be impacted. On the aspect of budget and finance, this was another area which was highlighted that it needs to be reviewed. In particular, the quantile system. The quantile system, oftentimes schools are not correctly put in a quantile that is designated for the school. For example, a school that is supposed to be quantile is the um, quantile three, you'll find it being at quantile five. And uh, that, that's all, that was also one of the issues they were saying, this needs to be um, reviewed. The issue of the exemption of tables and, and the, also the issue of the staffing uh, model. On the issue of the disclosure of financial interest, the submitters feel that on clause 14, which proposes the insertion of clause section 18A, compelling all members of a governing body to disclose their financial interest and their, that of their family members and that of their partners. They say that this disclosure is unreasonable invasion of privacy because as members of governing bodies, that has got nothing to do with their financial matters of their family. And therefore, ultimately, if they're required by the very act, sorry, by this bill to produce and bring on board their financial interest, it would mean that they put bare what other family members' interests would be. And ultimately, parents who would like, who would be selected as SGP members would deter making themselves available for such a participation in school. The home education um, trend or thing that emerges that the parents whose children are on home education feel that there was minimal consultation and they also argue that there was no research. If there was, it was a research which you have not seen. And they want to know the findings of such a research if there's one in place. Another thing they allude to is the fact that the home education is already regulated by the Children's Act. Now, why bring home education under the schools, South African Schools Act under this, as this Bella Bill is proposing? Another thing that is raised is that homeschooling and public schooling are two different things. They would rather prefer their children to have access to online lessons. And one of the reasons this site is that the current public school curriculum does not offer the flexibility that their um, children want. On the aspect of independent schools, they allude that their academic year runs three terms per annum, whilst the public schools run uh, four terms per annum. Therefore, a clause that proposes that they must submit four quarterly financial reports, likewise, the public schools would be unrealistic, and this would put them at a disadvantage. And the recommendation that we put forward is that on the issue of a public school funding is that they should be treated the same way that independent schools become uh, uh, public schools as is as, as, as expressed in the South African Schools Act 1549. On the issue of educators trend, even though the issue of educators are regulated by the Employment of Educators Act and is dealt with by the Education Labor Relations Council, some submitters welcomed the proposal that deals with clause nine. And the clause that prohibits educators from conducting business with the state was also welcome in the sense that the submitters feel to avoid a financial conflict of interest, the educator is an educator and must teach 
and a salary as state official or governor of staff. And the doing of business with state should be a prerogative of those who are not necessarily with the confine of state employment. Then another clause which relates to the influence of SDPs in terms of recruitment, there are the, the issue that comes from the submission that oftentimes the SDPs tend to exclude competent educators who are competent and qualify on the criteria. However, the set criteria based by the SGP sometimes not based on equity. Then extend that this leads to exclusion of educators who would have been appointed on merit. Honorable members, there's also input from the teacher union in SATU in particular, as we know that SATU is one of the um, organization that has massive uh, numbers of uh, a very big movement of the educators. SATU recommends that the EEA should be amended to ensure that grade R educators are employed in terms of the EEA and the provision is made in the post provision norms for grade R educators. Now, when it came to this issue of COVID, the bill itself, nowhere does it address COVID. Nowhere does the SATA Schools Act addresses COVID as same as the EA Act. However, when we're processing the submission, we noted that quite often there's a huge range of submissions that relate to COVID-19. And when, when we looked at it, the expressions and the sentiment that the public was doing was that they are objecting, as some parents, not all, they are objecting towards their children being uh, having a vaccination gap at school. They are objecting to the issue that when their children are being brought to school for admission, either at grade R or grade one, they must have been put in immunization. That's a parental decision. They are also expressing the fact that the bill did not take into account changes brought about by COVID-19 when the pandemic came through in the education sector. And due to the substantial changes that have come forth in terms of alt other alternate forms of education, these alternate forms are not expressed in the Bellaby. In particular, the online schools, virtual schooling, cottage schools, education centers and other cooperative homeschooling that if the bill therefore does not include them, this will cause a lot of confusion for officials who will go on and apply their own version of the act. Methodology in this instance is applicable to how we have processed and related to the procedures of um, um, looking at the written submission. The methodology that we applied was both qualitative and quantitative. Written submission captured, processed, and analyzed in line with the categories that I cited in the previous slide. Also, each staff member who's working in the team at the initial stage was given a batch of 100 to 500. And then thereafter, these submissions were also um, categorized into lengthy ones as well as short ones, um, which were the small email um, submissions. In short, honorable members, the procedures were applied, the methodology was applied, the submissions were allocated to staff members, these were captured and analyzed and categorized accordingly. Now, looking at the overview of how many submissions we received, this graph, honorable members, highlights that. From the 18,000 that we received, we have processed, uh, okay, from the 18,000 that was received, 17,452 were, were emails. There was one hard copy, there was one video, and 549 Google Forms. As, you, as one would note on this graphical presentation, the email submissions seem to have taken the larger counterpart. In terms of the formatting of emails, 
the Google Forms, the, the, the attachments. As the team working on these submissions, we have to take accountability and ensure that once the submissions were processed, that the secretariat developed a spreadsheet to determine exactly the figures, as well as once the submissions were completed, that they were stored electronically. Once we found out that a submission was uh, submitted, for example, in Afrikaans, we have translation services in parliament or in any other indigenous language to serve that to language services. However, from analysis, predominantly English submissions came forth the most and Afrikaans ones were then, they were also set to up language services. And then from language services, they will be brought back to the committee. I mean, to the secretariat deal with them. Substantive ones, which is the lengthy ones, we had outlined them and unpacked them in the MS Word format because it is easier to deal with a long substantive uh, submission in an SM Word format. Colleagues were also orientated on data handling to ensure that the information that comes from the public is aligned in accordance and that the responses on close by close summary. There's a guide that colleagues have to work with. On the issue of written submissions and requests for oral submissions, the public has, has, has expressed their best interest in this. And to date, there's 5465 written submissions that we have processed from the 18,000. And I'd like to reiterate the fact that this is work in progress. The next second draft report that we will submit, more will be, more will be processed. I'll skip the one on data uh, management and go straight to the process so far. This slide, honorable members, give us a picture of the 5,465 5, I spoke about, that 64% uh, is the MS, is a Excel spreadsheet, which were on email versions, and the 28% is the MS Word, which is the lengthy ones, and the 549 is the Google Forms. In terms of public responses that we have processed, um, the, there's disproportionate views that have come forth, and this is a reflection of how the public has responded, whether they support the bill, not support the bill, partially support the bill, or unspecified, and the numbers as declared there are also changing as we are receiving the, the, the processing of the, of the written submissions. But as I can state, so far, the no's seem to be at 3138, the yes, the five, partial 190, and unspecified 141. I think I've dealt with this one. What we've noted on the public responses, which I'd like to share with the members, is the fact that as the picture is emerging, um, those who have opposed in terms of the no submissions, they seem to be in the, in the majority in this first draft. However, honorable members, note that the majority of people who don't have access to means of making submissions have not as yet come forward to cast their yes or no or partial. And to that end also, there's a group such as um, Dear Bella Bill, South Africa, and there's also the group called Bestalozzi and others that have come forth with huge and large bulks of emails where they express the view that they reject the bill in its entirety. On the Google form submitted, the picture which emerged there Again, the 549 received 100 said yes at 18.3 percent. No was 415 at 75.6 percent and partial at 34 percent. With due regard now to the summary of observation, I would like to state that the groups that had mobilized bulk emails. Their mobilization brought on um, was also brought on by civil society organizations, by organizations of the NGOs, as well as some political parties. And the majority seem to have heard 
same wording or similar notions that, okay, we are advocating for this issue. We don't agree with this issue. We want this regulation in and this out. And also there was quite strong submissions on SGP powers, the admission policy, language policy. Those are things that we have observed. And as per the statistics um, have um, shown, I think we are still yet to see how um, the parliament or members of parliament in particular as representatives of the people can also determine the outcome of the Bella Pay. Further, we had noted that in some instances, there were submitters who had criticized the government and the critique coming forth, pertaining in particular the issue of the conditioning of the schools sector or the education sector. But what we found also as a gap is that while critique is good and while critique is valid and not balancing the critique and understanding that as much as there are challenges in our education system, provide that with effect. And whilst there are also developments within our education sector, appreciate the developments and the positive um, um, Okay, um, milestones that we have achieved as a country. For example, the improvement that is in Quandal 1 to 3 public schools. For a large majority of schools at Quandal 1 to 3, some of them have improved, even though we understand that there are challenges. So once we look at challenges, there's also an issue of also looking at what progress has been made. Global groups have put forward admission issues on clause five, section five, sorry, clause four, section five, in that um, this is not going to be feasible, particularly in poly resource schools. Coming to this point is of the clause by clause uh, specific issues. I will not deal with all of them due to the limitation of time so that I can also allow members some space to peruse this presentation. However, I would like to outline that. On clause one, one there's, a, there's a contingent of um, attorneys who have legal expertise, who have proposed amendments that um, there must be changes when it comes to the issue of definitions. Their concern is that if the wording is left as it is, it must not give a different interpretation because if that the issue, the syntax might cause a sentence to lose its way. What I mean by this is that how a sentence is structured in the definition of a clause, it must not give one person and one interpretation and another person another interpretation. It must be one understanding that this is the clause and this is what it means. That's, that's how we understood the vapor attendance. Another thing that also came is that the, defini the, the defining of meeting, we are now in, the, in, the, in the, the COVID era brought about virtual meetings. And now when you define meetings and that the term proposes meeting, they also argue that this needs to be specifically to be properly defined. Um, Compulsory attendance, there were issues there which were also raised, and the concern was in particular the insertion of clause two in section two, which deals and cites the issue of the capacity that uh, the way the infrastructure is currently at many of the schools. Can these schools really admit learners and that the, the issue of compulsory attendance uh, has the, the, the necessary required um, effect? And some submitters had proposed that the issue of the school going age of a learner should be stated in the act. Some more proposals that came forth, in particular from the issue of the um, increased penalty, Sato had then engaged on this proposal to say the department should rather have an interaction with the parent or the guardian or the person taking care of the child and to understand the reasoning for the wrongful behavior before criminal proceedings could be instituted. 
and also try to understand what could have been the social economic conditions, the context, and the literacy level of caregivers, and the type of support that was needed before such um, legal parameters could be taken against them. Another issue that they raised is the fact that, um, sorry. I was sorry for this. Um, they were indicating the explicitity in the application that when the proposition clarifies the position of teachers that are being legally on strike, that definition also of willfully interrupting or disrupting any school activity should be clearly defined in a way that would engage the union members' rights to also engage in lawful activities of union. On the issue of unlawful or intentional disturbance of schools activities, one of the recommendations that is being made is that if, for example, a political party, for example, disturbs a school activity, compulsory school attendance will be affected, which per se may not necessarily be a, a lawful picketing, but it may be interpreted or hindrance, and therefore this could be liable for imprisonment on the aspect maybe of the teachers and those who are also participating on behalf of their party. On the issue of monitoring uh, learner attendance, the home educator sector is not happy with this clause. They feel that they are being targeted. Again, here the unions have felt that both parents and the schools are responsible for the learner attendance and then put the question as to how will the department balance school accountability, parental and guidance accountability. On the subsection four, which looks at the provision for the principal to delegate his her authority within 24 hours, the question that is being raised is that if the 24 hours now falls after a weekend, a day must be reasonably extended so that the proposed further intervention may also be defined in the clause. I think we've dealt at large with the admission to public schools. However, the issue that is being raised is that the Department of Basic Education and the Department of Home Affairs needs to have a bilateral discussion whereby they assist and facilitate the issue of documentation of learners. Where there are learners who have not obtained their documentation and they are regarded as undocumented learners. To some parents, this carries a financial cost and it also costs or may cause a burden on the parents. That is where now the issue of the bilateral would assist coming on board to ensure that learners are being assisted, to ensure that they get admission to public schools with the proper documentation at hand. Um, on the clause for section five, which also seeks to, after consultation with the governing body, put the final authority on the HOD to admit a learner to a public school. Honorable members, this was again met with some, some, some concerns that says, if this, if the HOD then has the final authority, once again, the SGP role uh, as referenced in the South African Schools Act and the accountability they already have and hold in the community seem to be diminished if this now responsibility is given to the HOD. And again, this would be seen as a conflict between an HOD and an SGP, and this should be avoided at all cost. <clears throat> this slide, as to all the recommendations that were made on clause four, one of the most striking ones is the fact that there must be a strong committee involvement, which should be encouraged as schools. That shows high level of commitment and that the SGPs have proven themselves over time that they can be active, highly effective. Some are highly effective 
and where the SGPs are struggling functionally, it's where then that the department can also come in and bring in some level of support. But it, it must not necessarily just be all the government bodies. Another issue that was raised is that the department in particular should rather bring in as well a secretariat role to assist governing bodies rather than usurping powers to override as well as to take over. That's how it is being seen. On the clause of section five, sorry, clause five, section six, the language policy, large number of submissions are again related to clause five, whereby there's a proposition to amend um, clauses, subsection five and 20, to limit again the determination of the school language policy. Um, in essence, the majority reason is that again, with the SG and the HOD should never be allowed to prescribe the language policy. Um, some felt that, I will also raise this particular one, some submitters felt that this language policy clause seems to be removing Africans as a medium of instruction. And as we looked at the bill as a team, we felt that we don't see that being retained. We don't know where it's coming from. However, it means therefore that at the point of going around the public hearings and all that, the public out there needs to be given a factual information that this bill is not about removing Afghans. This bill is substantially about looking at these amendments as a way of also ensuring that there's sound cooperative governance and that all the languages are dealt with in a, in a manner that is consistent with the constitution. This slide looks at recommendations which were made for clause number six. One of them is that a new funding and staff model for multi-language schools, especially in the light of proposed amendments regarding the HOT powers must be put in place to ensure that the needs of the community language is taken into consideration. Clause 7, Section 8 is dealing with the adoption of school code of conduct. This particular one takes also into account the provincial laws and the constitution of the um, Republic. The argument from the submitters is that this, the term that says that clause is simply too wide. And being too wide is a concept, it can lead to frivolous application. By frivolous applications, anyone can, 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 can. This post, this post. Yes, sir. We are losing audio. you. Your network is not stable. We keep on losing you. Is it? Um, she's very clear on my side, Chair. Thank you. She's, she's clear, Chair. I think maybe you might have a challenge with oh, network. Oh, okay. Sorry, Chair. Proceed, okay. Proceed. Um. The submitters feel that the term just cause should be replaced by a term such as religious or cultural or medical ground, but it, it must just be defined and properly defined so that it has it can serve its intended purpose. Um, others are of the view that while it is a wide concept, it seems to now offer some gray areas. And in the execution of disciplinary measures, you can't execute disciplinary measures with a clause that is going to be created. Therefore, they either propose that it can be deleted and something has been brought in, or this conduct could be exempted. Another proposal was that in favor of the also placing this on school matters as explained, that the participation whilst the offending person would come on board to appeal, that the SGB 
should also be invited to put in if they say, okay, you are, we are condoning this or we are not. And in a way now, that will require now the assistance of the MEC. Such informed decision should create a platform that allows for the mediation between the learner and the school. Clause eight, sorry, clause seven, section eight. Um, there were also some disagreements in terms of the code of conduct, which purport that it seems that the government seems to be steering in, a, in an authoritarian way. However, what the, government, the department rather do is to provide guidance and support. And lastly, on this clause is that the code of conduct should rather not be punitive, but offer restorative as well as supportive guidance. Another issue which was raised is that the code of conduct should also be more inclusive, particularly if it takes care of the issues of the LGBTQI identities and also allowing freedom of expression to prevail in the education sector. Clause 8, Section 8A deals with the conditions under which liquor may be possessed, consumed, or sold on school premises. Honorable members, we received here a bit of contrasting views on this clause. While others supported, others are also not in favor or were objecting. In particular, also faith-based faith -based organizations are also raising objections that as a country, we are battling with drugs. As a country, we have substance abuse at alarming proportions. Therefore, dealing with these laws, the, 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 the process must be such that all eyes open for the sake of the child, for the growth of the child. On the other hand, those, are sub, for those submitters who are supporting but are indicating that once subsection one um, alludes that a submission, or sorry, an application from the government, from the governing body to the HOD must, this is about supplementing the resources of the school, for example, in fundraising efforts. This now must expand it that an application is made to the department. Within 14 days, the department must respond to the application. If there is no response from the Department of Education. Then it will be deemed that that application has been accepted and that those wishing to do the um, selling on the premises can continue because the argument was that sometimes it takes longer for the department to respond on, 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 on corresponding. So there's, a, there's an alert here of a 14 day period, which is being recommended. Um, clause nine deals with the issue of misconduct. And uh, the issue is that often the learner returns to school, leaves the victim vulnerable. So when the schools are maintaining the issue of discipline in schools, it becomes a major challenge. Now, a learner who has been expelled from a school has a right to appeal against HOT decision. However, the SGP as well. In terms of this right, if they also wish to contest this decision by the OHOD, then it means that it must take it to the court. Now, the submitters of the that this right being accorded to the SGP should be amended to establish a right of appeal for the SGP as well. Section 12 is more of a specialized focus on talent. That one is a straight one, and I'd like to skip on that one. Clause 13, section 12a is a measure of well, two or more schools. The argument or the issue of concern was when we're merging these two schools, which schools will be selected which will to merge with, with the other one. And there was, there was a feeling that um, the closeness of the geographic proximity could be selected for a merger. But again, the issue of which school merges with the other one in the a bond of contention. Close the SGP disclosure of financial interest. We've raised this one. 
However, I would like to consider that to state that those who support this introduction says that this issue of declaration of management of interest of HGPs is accepted to be a practice of good, uh, to be a good governance practice. Those who are against it feel that this would be closure of uh, their financial interest would be an issue that now as HGP members having to bear their family and um, financial interest to the public of which they were not in favor of. <clears throat> On the issue of the HOD, centrally procuring the learning and support materials for schools, most submitters were just not okay with this one because they feel that for a long time, SGPs have been doing this. So this amendment now will arbitrarily withdraw this function from SGP out any new process followed again would be an indication that it seems to allow um, the HOD more powers. And then the feeling is that they have dealt with it and to centrally procure for schools, to deliver books is a real concern. Because oftentimes the department does not necessarily have the capacity to deliver quality material on time. Um, but then withdrawal of function of more governing bodies. Again, here the issue was not the exclusive granting of decision making powers to the and the provision that is being made is that sometimes the provision is tended to abuse by departmental officials. I don't know how true this is. However, it comes, they say that this comes when officials fail to accept also their own administrative um, support to the SDP, they form their mandate in a conducive uh, working environment. Meaning that, therefore, that when it comes to the issues of decision making function, SDP still feels that based on the reason that they put forward, the decision making powers should be left. These pages alluded to the recommendations. Um, where the governing body has ceased to fail to perform and the NC making an appeal for authority of dissolution, again, this clause was met with some problematic um, expression cited, and that the it should not necessarily be a blanket approach to all SGPs, but those which are poorly performing. A non remuneration of SGP for the performance of duties. The submitters alluded to the fact that they do understand that members of the SGP, um, um, that the members of the governing bodies um, who are not reinvested for the work that they do. However, they want to put forward that, sorry, they are not remunerated for the work that they are doing. But at least they should be reimbursed for reasonable expenses that they have incurred towards the attendance of meetings and other school um, activities. That's the recommendation that they're putting forth. On clause 25, oh, dealing with the issue of the parent as chairperson of the finance committee for the public school, the proposal is that from the public, of course. It should be a parent, not an educator. Submitters propose that when it is reasonably practical, the parent will, must always be as the cheapest because this has huge financial implications. And if it is left in the hands of an educator, the educator must deal with the education of the children and leave this part to the parent. On clause 28, section 36, the approval by MEC for SDP entering into lease agreement, there were some objections raised. One of them being that the SDP is a legal entity of its own. They should be able to participate in the business of keeping the school viable in the interest of the community it serves. Um, I think I can. I think this one still is a continuation of the list issues. 
And then in the views 429 rate trial amendments, here there's a proposition that it must be allowed for the minister and not the HOD to determine the directions under which NSTP must establish and administer how it runs full funds in accordance with the SASA Act. Clause 30, section 38, refers to the budget being made available to parents. Most definitely, the, 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 the submitters know that the um, proposed amendment may have a hindrance effect on the proper and effective management of the school, which mandates that they must already regard the funds to have been applied to improve the quality of education for all learners. The STP are already obliged to report to parents on expenditure patterns as well as income during the annual general meetings of the public schools. The same done. Um, HOD powers clause 34, section 43, having you to authorize an investigation into the financial affairs of the schools. Some are objecting, some look at it as a positive that this proposed, I mean, noting that already they submit quarterly reports apart from the annual audited financial report that SGPs would have submitted. This now places a tremendous financial admin burden, not only on the SGP, not only on the school resources, but also on the department. And the recommendation put forth is that it must be to individual instances where sufficient reason that exists for such an investigation that requires now this investigation to be done that it can be. However, schools are already submitting their annual financial statement. Section 37, clause 37, section 51 deals with home education. We've dealt with one, this one on the previous one. Jesus. Honorable members, this proposed bill in its entirety was a response that number of submissions. First, submissions we are uh, indicating that they are rejecting the bill in its entirety. For example, an email will look at one sentence, just the bill in its entirety. And then when we looked at those, we just looked at the email submission, put it into the spreadsheet, then it did it. And then sometimes they don't even indicate the reason why they don't support the bill, uh, I mean, in its entirety. They will just come in to say, this is one comment. And in some instances, um, members, we, we dealt with offensive language, which really was not appreciated. And you'll find this vocality of strong messages put forth in this submission. We don't understand where this anger is coming from, but in, 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 a, in a way, it sits somewhere and it has to be dealt with along the social cohesion aspect. The majority of the recommendations as submitted um, speak to the replacement of sections and others would allow that the HOD should keep track of children who are receiving education elsewhere other than in schools, and that the clause with exams compulsory attendance for children whose parents have notified HOD of their intention and a discontinuation of the exemption of compulsory attendance on when the child returns to schools. Um, this slide for now reveals the organizations that have expressed and have confirmed their attendance for the public or oral public hearings that will be conducted in parliament in the week from the week of the 8th of November. We have put this for now in the sense that as we are continuously progressing to look at the oral submission request. In the course of last week, Mr. Brown had indicated it had an interaction to check the availability. And for now, honorable members, if Mr. Brown um, the expressions made with myself, and I can allow him please as well to speak on this slide. But this is the last part of this presentation. Thank you, Mr. Brown. And over to you on this one. Uh, well, no, thank you, uh, Portia. Thank you, members of the committee, Chairperson. Just as uh, Portia has indicated, 
the the oral oral hearings will will commence as of next week, the eighth. Uh, we have three rounds of oral submissions uh, for now, which is on the eighth, the fifteenth, and on the twenty second. Um, uh, for these uh, stakeholders that have already indicated their availability. <clears throat> uh, these these hearings will be held at Parliament, Chairperson, um, at a committee room S12A in the NCOP uh, as, of, uh, as of Tuesday the 8th. And uh, stakeholders have been informed and we will commence with the hearings on the 8th at 9 o'clock in committee room S12A. Just, uh, just another indication, Chair, is that uh, since then, we've, there has been uh, additional requests for oral submissions. Um, as, as indicated, Chairperson, we have submitted uh, an application to the, to the House Chair and Chief Whip's Office for possible uh, extra time for us to meet, if it means that we can meet during the plenary, uh, plenary time, uh, uh, or we will we'll wait for, for a director from that office, Chairperson. But there is at least another uh, three, three rounds of hearings that can commence. And uh, we will we will wait for a directive in respect of how we how best we are able to accommodate uh, those new uh, requests for oral submissions before the end of the of the term. Uh, Chairperson, other than that, uh, on the oral submissions, that is where we are, and so we we will commence as of next Tuesday, the uh, the eighth of November. Uh, thank you, Chair. All right. Um, thank you very much for the presentation um, from uh, both of you, Suskos and, and Llewellyn. Members, that's the, that's the um, submission outlook. That's how it looks now. Taking into account that um, the team has only processed about um, 5,000 a uh, more or less submission and we've got about 18,000. I think I've been raising consistently that the problem was the human resource, um, which I think um, Parliament has managed to, to, to assist in terms of um, 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 giving us more people to process um, from parliamentary staff to process the, the, the submissions. So um, we are not even at half of processing um, the submissions. We are not even at 9,000. Um, hopefully by next week, Tuesday, we will be somehow very nearer to half. But we are deciding that we should not wait for the team to finish all 18 um, submissions, we should proceed with the with the bodies that are there to come and make the oral submission. So we will do these processes um, together. They will process and then we, we, we they will process uh, the submissions as, as they as they as they have them and then we will process the the the, the, the oral submission uh, bodies that that needs to come. Um, I'm going to allow members, uh, if there are point of clarities uh, that would want uh, that they would want to raise on 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 both the the presentation and the process that um, we have outlined, how is it going to to unfold? The intention here is to make sure that by the end of this year, when we rise. We are intending, if things go as um, as planned, to have been done with the submissions. Um, so my request as the chairperson of the committee is that um, all our members must be ready, one, to come physically to parliament because we are going to engage on the process of um, oral submission physically in parliament. Um, and from nine o'clock, not 9.30, but nine o'clock because we are intending to finish at one or 1.30 so that we can um, do the, um, we, can, we, can, we can go to plenary. But where plenary won't need 
all of us, we are going to engage um, the house chair um, that we, we proceed uh, with, our, with our meetings. So the likelihood is that we can be in plenary or not. It's gonna depend on the program for that particular Tuesday of parliament. Um, so I'm just trying to make everybody aware that um, for the next three to four weeks, probably, we're going to have to make our arrangement to come to parliament as members of the portfolio committee so that we deal with the oral submissions in parliament. Um, they are getting us the venue probably at the NCOP side where we'll be dealing with this uh, parliament, which, of course, is going to also help us in knowing the bodies that are involved in the sector so as we meet them um, facially and of course the public that is interested in the in the bill. I'm allowing you to speak members um, on this bill. I'm allowing you to raise um, the issues that you would want to raise as you take note that this is a um, a work in progress. We are reporting on the on the work in progress. I'm seeing the hand of uh, Boshoff and not Dada and Fanseif in that order. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, no, I want to welcome uh, this presentation. I'm just going, uh, just showed my face for, let's say, for uh, rest, uh, you know, to be sure that it's me speaking. Uh, but for bandwidth, I, I would close it. I, I would like to welcome this presentation. I don't think uh, one would like to argue with the presentation a lot because it's a summary of what has been submitted to the committee and the process going forward, uh, seeing these organizations who um, indicated that they want to present orally. I think it should be lively engagement if I look at it. And um, I, I make the deduction from the way in which uh, the summary was presented that the idea is that there was a well orchestrated um, opposition to the, um, to the bellable and that that might not uh, necessarily um, reflect exactly what is going on in the, uh, let's say, in public at large. But I think there are times that one um, uh, wants to weigh arguments rather than count them. And this is what's going to happen during the um, uh, oral presentations. Um, I just want to confirm, but I think you have confirmed it just now, that this won't be a, a, these oral presentations won't be a hybrid uh, uh, meetings, but, but only physical. Uh, which I would actually welcome, uh, but but if you may just confirm that, and I think uh, one would wish to to thank the uh, staff who had to work through a, a huge volume of um, presentations, and add to that that it is an indication of uh, number one that it is a highly emotive um, bowl before the house. Um, even when one attempts to have a, a, a public response to something, it's not always easy to, to get it. Um, so it's not only, let's say, advocacy groups being very effective. It is really that this touches the, um, the hearts and minds of uh, the general public. Uh, and that it had to be uh, processed in a, in a responsible way. Uh, goes beyond saying, or it's uh, without saying, but I think the, uh, the staff uh, did well. So thank you very much, Honourable Chair. Thank you. No, Dada? Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Chair, thank you so much for the presentation from, from the team. Um, I, I, I just wanted to raise just three points. The first one is that as part of the summary, it's good to see that there's a, a qualitative argument, um, you know, on for against the bill that comes through because 
um, it gives us a, a good sign of determining what the, the genuine views are of uh, South Africans that have participated in the 18,000 comments that are there. Um, and I do think it's important that, as you've indicated, that there are quite 130 odd attachments uh, to the uh, written submissions that have been put in place, that those also be shared with the committee so that we can look at some of these qualitative arguments that are put in place for or against the bill or partial support of the bill so that um, also when we do engage with the bill, um, and the various uh, stakeholders that were present to us orally. And when we take the bill forward to, to the public, we are able to look at what are the qualitative uh, arguments that are there beyond the, the quantitative uh, arguments that are there. So I think it's very important that that comes out very strongly. Um, the second thing, Chair, is to ask what is the role of the legal um, a team in parliament in this particular point in time um, and what role are they continuously going to be playing um, in advising uh, on how we deal with the bill moving forward. The last request I would like to make chair is to you and I think this has also come through quite strongly um, in some of the summary that has been put through to us around you know saying there's a general consensus that you know making great are compulsory um you know is supported and so on and so on i do think that there's going to be a need for us to invite uh, specific stakeholders um to kind of give us guidance uh, in some of these things just beyond the legal team of parliament if there's a role that they are playing in in, in specified into what um, as an example the department of national treasury um, you know, on the practical implementation of, of this proposed law, you know. Um, so I think it's some of these things that we're going to have to kind of process and make sure that we've got our ducks in a row um, in, in making sure that when we do deal with the bill, uh, we deal uh, with it uh, quite extensively and holistically um, and not just from, you know, a, a, a processing uh, tick box exercise type of view. And then Mr. Brown, if my clarity can just be asked on the stakeholders that have been indicated that the state that are going to make oral submissions, um, the ones that are on the list um, below, uh, I think after COSAS, there's quite a few people on the list there that have requested to make submissions like UCT online school and other things. Are those people going to be afforded an opportunity to make oral submissions um, or are they just cited there because they haven't scheduled um, a time and a date or availability yet or are they not going to be uh, given that opportunity um, i think that's all from my side chair thanks thank you fansail thank you chairperson good morning everyone i won't switch on my camera i'm i'm in one of the homes in acacia that's got very bad signal inside the house um, my concern, well, well, first of all, just a thanks to the, the staff that has processed what they could have in, in the space of time. But, you know, I think um, just a, a vote of, I don't know if it's, um, uh, um, uh, I don't know the word, but, you know, to ask them if they can possibly, you know, process a, a lot quicker because this will affect um, many South Africans, um, be they children or parents that we can get as a committee, uh, the proper view of those submissions that has, has been made already. I think chair, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Masabela. Okay, thank you chair. So on the issue of the methodology of processing submissions, if you say was quantitative, how far and why did the inputs come from? Then again, Chair, are the public views reflecting the location of people in terms of rural, township, and urban communities? We're asking this, Chair, because the fear is that the submissions could have come from particular communities, easily canvassed for their narrow objectives. Have we really gone out 
to the deep rural areas to touch base vulnerable who need the changes in the amendments. Uh, the third uh, point here, Chair, which I want to make, rural areas are clearly left out, in my view. What steps are we going to take to reach out these rural areas? So, Chair, I think we cannot conclude that these submissions are a true representation of how ordinary people really feel. Did we take adverts in community radio stations? Chair, I think that this process needs to restart or be given another opportunity in order to reach rural ordinary citizens. Even the list of organizations Chair, is not representing the rural people. The list itself is not representative of rural people. Thank you, Chair. I'll pause there. No, thank you very much. Um, Vita um, van der Waal. Good morning, Chair and colleagues, and pardon me for also not switching on my <clears throat> video now. Chairperson, I'd just like um, two things that I would like to bring to the attention. <clears throat> the one thing is that um, I was partly covered by uh, Honourable Bax Lily, but what I would like to know is in various uh, clauses in this proposed bill, we have stakeholders that we aren't all experts on. Say, for example, which is the easy one to use, is <clears throat> there are clauses on homeschooling. If there wasn't any inputs from a homeschooling sector, um, does the committee have the right to call uh, for inputs, not objections and ordinary inputs, but on clarification, or will, will that only be allowed from the legal team? Because I think it would be fair to, to make sure on such an important and emotional uh, bill that we make sure that we do cover in, in our presentation right at the end to Parliament that we as a committee also, not only through our legal uh, department, but that we are sure we are doing the right thing. And may I also ask, um, Chairperson, uh, a previous colleague referred to the very far rurals. I would just like to mention um, that it would also be very unfair for um, circuit managers, as an example, to send out notices to, to schools uh, and say, get your SGBs or your parents to, to accept, or not accept, but in this case is to, to support the proposals, because I think it is not only for that sector, it is the SGBs I find in the rural provinces are actually quite active because they do want better education. So that, those are just the comments um, I would make, Chair. And then lastly, sorry, Chair, it's three points, um, is uh, the in-person um, meetings with stakeholders. Um, I'm glad that the process won't wait till um, the work is done by the administrative uh, sector in, in, on this bill, because what we would want is the process to run and not be halted. But it is also true that we always see that there are people that might still come in and motivate um, to come and do oral presentation and whether that will be allowed, can be allowed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Honourable Advance. Thank you, Honourable Chairperson, and good morning to your good self and honourable members. 
the DG and the entire team of um, um, DBE that is in the meeting. Chair, let me also um, appreciate and welcome the, the report um, that has been uh, presented to us uh, today. Um, we are made aware that uh, it is not um, it's just a draft, it's not a final, final report, but also uh, welcome your decision or um, request that we must um, run the process uh, co concurrently for both uh, the uh, process of um, uh, oral submissions and also proce uh, processing of, of this um, uh, written uh, 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 comments. Uh, because um, I think this is just one of the, you know, phases or uh, processes that must unfold for us to, you know, to conclude with the bill. Uh, when we when we adopt it in Parliament. Uh, however, Chair, I have a request that maybe there's a need for um, uh, the, 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 the team that is processing um, the, 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 the comments, uh, the written comments, uh, maybe to be beefed up. Um, if you recall the last day, uh, or the, the due date for this uh, for this bill or for the written comments was the 15th of August. And we, they only managed to process a plus or minus 5,000 and there's almost like more than 13 or less than 13,000 remaining. And if uh, you say that we, we need to push at least by the end of the term when we rise to have you know moved with in, in doing the work, um, I request maybe that the the team be you know um, beefed up so that they they process as many as possible um, a, a, a written comments and maybe have a better picture of how the the the, the written comments uh, would look like because now we're only dealing or making um you know assumptions on on only five thousand that has been has been processed. So that is my request, Chair, that uh, as much as we run the process concurrently, but let the, the, the team be beefed up so that, you know, they run, you know, the process faster and we're able also to know if there's a need also to make time or more time for other, other oral submissions. I think oral, oral will, if not other, or somebody ask if there are any other, um, a request for for oral submissions. So it might be some of those are in the, the, the 13,000 that has not been uh, processed, but that is my submission, Chair. I really uh, appreciate the report that we received today. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Principal. My <clears throat> beloved Chair, good morning and good morning to everyone on this all important platform with this very important and essential task that lies ahead of us. Uh, let us appreciate the presentation from DBE as led by the DG. I'm not so sure if both the minister and the deputy minister, it was just an omission that I cannot see them, but nonetheless, I saw my learned friend, the Director General to this department. Uh, would you like to know, you have raised quite a number of important points as you were trying to sum up. It's true, one rises to support that uh, it is important that we will have to be physical if we must be seen doing justice to this task, the assignment lying ahead of us. And uh, I would plead, therefore, that where possible, the necessary arrangements be made so that we get uh, the accommodation you're talking of, so that we see each other face to face and be able to adjudicate on this matter of the written submissions. 
Um, um, in very important, of course, Chair, is that uh, uh, that opportunity will also be giving us uh, a great moment of identification of the major stakeholders. You see, you cannot visit or go out for public hearings and just meet everybody who thinks he knows or he has got an interest in education. We must be able to meet the people, the stakeholders, which will be able to add meaning and purpose at the end of this amendment of the act. So that situation you are proposing is handy or will become handy in us addressing that. But the last point, which I feel I must raise, is with regard to members of the portfolio committee. We are coming from different political groupings. There might be others who are, as members of the portfolio committee, are allergic to some of the proposal within, the, within this bill. However, Chair, what is very important is it may not be the right time for the members of the portfolio committee to show open signs or start critiquing the bill, which has already gone through parliament. It is subjected to us. Let us go out to the members outside the parliament and outside this portfolio committee and get their views. But for us to cross question and seems as if we are openly opposed to the bill, that will be unparliamentary. Thank you, Chair. What are you talking about, Roni? Thank you. Um, Tuella, you now you are out of order. You are not given a platform to speak. Suela. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and greetings to the colleagues in the platform. Well, Che, I, I rise to support the proposal that, um, uh, that you made regarding the, the physical attendance, as well as the proposal by the WIP, which suggested that if possible, the team dealing with the analysis of the uh, submissions must be beef must be beefed up so that uh, they are able to deal with the 18,000 submissions to give us a clearer picture because 5,000 uh, 5,000 of uh, what they've done is just around 28% of the total submission. Probably if we can get to around 50% plus one, it may give a clearer in, in indication uh, than what we have now. Again, she, I have this question. During the presentation, it was mentioned that um, some of the submissions probably have have the same wording. I would like to know from the presenter, what was the percentage of, of that, of the total submission of the 5,000? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, Resuela. Um, so suppose, do you have anything to respond to? Let me try to answer Chair, some of them, but it is a, I would say kindly, uh, if I can allow also the team members that I work with to also put in some, some inputs as the questions uh, have come forth. First and foremost, Chair, I would like to, on behalf of the team and management, appreciate the opportunity 
that we were given by the portfolio committee. We are very grateful, honorable members, that you had trusted us that we can do the work and the primary responsibility of ensuring that the written submissions have been processed and were busy processed. On the question that was raised by Honorable Notada, uh, where he raised the issue of the advert with regards to the qualitative argument and the role of the legal team, what is their role? Fortunately, Ms. Pumele Lengema, that we interact with her whenever required, is also in the platform today. She was invited, and even in another meeting, he came forth to present to the committee uh, how the committee can uh, process. That, that role is present of the legal team from when we started. So they are there to guide us as well. On the issue of the qualitative argument, Honorable Nodata, my response can be as follows that when we say the methodology has taken both the qualitative and the quantitative procedures, I mean that we have looked at their responses. We have measured that there are so many that are saying no, so many say yes, so many saying partial. That gives you an indication that we were handling data in terms of also quantifying and measuring. Hence, we had also come up with some statistics that allude to the percentages. That's the quantitative aspect. On the qualitative aspect, there are lengthy written submissions. And the lengthy written submissions, as I indicated in the presentation, we have formatted them on the MS Word format so that the MS Word format can bring on board substantive issues that the public submitter had raised and written. And out of that, we also had to look at the explanatory notes or make some explanations on this particular draft report as an extraction of the source of information from submissions as submitted. I, I, I think I have tried to answer that one. And the issue of the advert, okay, the uh, uh, requesting to get the um, attachments. I may be correct or incorrect, but I'd like to state this upfront so that I can also be corrected in that. There was a clause that we dealt with with the legal, with the legal uh, team, in particular, where we, in the, where we looked at the draft, I mean, at the, at the advert that says, people who are making the submissions, we will respect the Popier Act of July 2021, in the sense that once the submissions are received, there's the aspect of privacy. Now, if we have to bring on board what they have um, expressed, I am yet again to be guided. Hence, I'm saying I speak subject to correction in the sense that the advert itself has alluded to the Popier Act of 2021, in particular, the issue of privacy. Honorable Van Zyl, um, I note the, 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 the question that was requested that we should do the processing of the submissions uh, much faster. And also this has come forth from um, quite a number of members like uh, Honorable Ado. On the processing from August to date, we would have loved to do more than what is there right now. Regrettably, we are working as a team that relies on other staff members in parliament. For example, when the parliament was in recess, we had to call people on board 
and some were on leave. It left us with minimal skeleton of staff deal with the submissions. And others already had to go and support the section 29 on the inquiry um, uh, public hearings which were taking place. And now and again, once we find that in over and above the substantive work that a person is doing in his or her own unit, it becomes a challenge to do as much as we would have done. We are trying. We spend endless hours. You can ask Rowena. We try, but the best that we have done so far was also work done under pressure and work done to make sure that we fast track this bill. At this particular moment, subject to correction, I cannot as yet, without consulting my manager as well, to say we will give this X number of um, human resources because. In my role and my current portfolio, I am not necessarily uh, responsible for um, human resource allocation. So it's something that I will discuss with my unit manager after this meeting. And I hope I've clarified that one. On the question raised by Honorable Mashabella, we welcome that question as well. I think on the aspect of the qualitative, I've tried to respond. But where she has raised an issue of the people from the rural areas not seeing their submissions coming forth. We agree with you, Honorable Mashabel. Hence, on page 29 of the presentation, the expression was still as much as a graph, majority of most, the majority of South Africans have not. Their responses, yes, and we did by it nine of the presentation. Limbombo, in particular, had raised an issue on sec on clause eight, section eight A, which deals with the conditions under which liquor may be sold and possessed in a school. They came vehemently against that. And when we saw that for us, it was again a province that says we're coming forward. However, in other instances, the submitters did not necessarily put forward what province they came from. How we have deduced where the location, where the, this, this, in, this submission is, look, is coming from, our spreadsheet was also allowing people to create and state where this problem. But on the last one, on this one, Oral Mashabella, I could humbly say the role of members in the constituency was very critical as well to assist the members of the public to understand that there is a bill, the Bella Bill, come on board and participate. And uh, in that way, it's an empowering process that ensures that also massive participation is happening from the ground. And would have also loved to see consistent contribution from the ground, township areas, rural areas, South Africa at large, bringing forth their voices uh, to, to, to make their voices heard in this particular bill. Um, Honorable Van de Valt, you have raised an issue on the issue of homeschooling around to the issue whether people can be called for inputs. I cannot uh, uh, respond on that question. However, I think I will allow the committee also to give some, some indication on that. For me, as a staff member, as an official, it is not on, my, on, on our call ready to respond to that. Uh, however, I'm still yet to be guided and directed. Um, the question on processing 5,465 out of the 18,000 that we need to push, we can try to push honorable adults. I need to state again and reiterate 
we have a human resource challenge big time. We rely on people from other units. Even this morning, we received a colleague who said, I've assisted this committee up to this far. I am no longer available to assist. Then it means at the end of the day and tomorrow, we must still go outside, I mean, in the, in the unit sections and ask other managers to release their staff members. It is, it, 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 it is very, very, um, it is very challenging, I must say. But with the skeleton staff that we have, we try. And it's been work that was done also under um, um, severe pressure with people submitting and making sure that the work is being done. Honorable Mara Settler, I think the comments that we've made, there was no question more than being comments, unless I have missed, um, missed your point there. Um, Honorable Suela, you had asked a winding up of percentages of the 18,000. What is five, four, six, four percentage? Mr. Brown and Mr. Kekana, my dear colleagues, may you kindly assist me on that one because I was also trying to make sure that I give some response on some of the questions that, that, the, that were raised. So far, I can pause and also allow the staff members to, to give some answers. Thank you. Anything from you, Mr. Kekana, Mr. Brown? Uh, Chairperson, it's Llewellyn. Um, just on two issues that, <clears throat> that was raised, Chairperson, the one was on the hybrid. Uh, yes, uh, Honourable um, Dr. Boshoff, uh, the the venue that we'll be using, we've specifically chosen because of its hybrid uh, capabilities, and we have been uh, in contact and engaging with uh, Sound and Vision from Parliament uh, to ensure that the room is is fully hybrid uh, capable on the day, because of course there might be one or two that cannot be there physically uh, due to travel challenges. So they will join us probably on the virtual platform live uh, on the day. Uh, on the issue that Honorable Nodada requested in respect of those that have requested uh, oral submissions that are not currently part of the of the, 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 the three rounds that we've already scheduled. Yes, Honorable Nodada, we, we uh, as Chapers indicated, uh, an application has been made to the uh, to the ha house chairperson and chief whip's office for a possible uh, permission for us to meet, uh, even if it is during uh, plenary. I'm anxiously awaiting that uh, that approval. It's currently with the office of the chief whip, uh, and we are hoping that we are allowed to to meet, which would mean uh, that we would then be able to have slots in the afternoon from two till around five, uh, again physically. Uh, at Parliament uh, for us to be able to to uh, accommodate those those extra uh, uh, requests for oral submission. There's been quite a few. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairperson. Mr. Gikana? Yes, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, is Mr. Gikana speaking? Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm audible because I can't see. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah, um, I would like to express my satisfaction and joy for in the manner the members have engaged the process um, of the Bella Bill and uh, give them the guarantee that uh, we must not forget that before the Bella Bill came to Parliament, it was also a taken on process by the department. And in that process, I had one member indicating the issue of financial feasibility, that we should uh, invite um, uh, people from the finance to check the feasibility, uh, perhaps on the probability of this deal being uh, financially sound. I think that was taken on board by the Department of Basic Education in the first round of it being brought into. Because all policies before they are uh, taken on board, 
there is a certain process that they are taking on. And one of them is to check whether they will be uh, feasible in terms of the availability of the fiscals. So that process has been done. And uh, even before uh, this, the finalization of this uh, Bella bill, we would also have to engage, bring back uh, our stakeholders to ensure that in the changes that has been put effective, uh, the bill is still strong enough in terms of its co uh, compliance to, to be feasible when it comes to uh, the financial feasibility. Uh, so the other thing that uh, one would uh, indicate is that um, you know, the reason why some of the, the, the things could have looked slower is the fact that as uh, the, the staff we have been running processes you know, parallel, like today you see the meeting is about the Bella Bill, it's also about the BRRR. This work is overwhelming for, for, for members of the staff. At the same time, we have also been dealing with other matters pertaining to the, to, to, to the community, which made it even more difficult. That is why we were highly stressed. But we are optimistic that um, after such a, um, inputs we get and advice we got from the committee, we will uh, pull up our socks to ensure that we are able to meet the expectation of the members. And we are indeed able to ensure that even as we'll be doing oral submissions, uh, the, this other uh, analysis shall have been completed. So this is my submission, uh, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kekana. Um, Mr. Bandi, Mr. Bandi is the committee manager. She, he is the one that is managing um, everyone in committees. So the issue of the, the human resource, he is the one that must assure us of it. Um, I'm allowing you to speak, uh, uh, Mr. Bandi. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Good morning, honorable members and, and colleagues. I'll uh, just show my face very briefly and then switch, switch the camera off. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chairperson, um, I just want to reassure the committee that uh, we are supporting the, the team. Members have raised uh, a range of very useful comments that will assist us to improve on uh, uh, how we are uh, managing the, the program so far. We're going to take note of all the, of all the inputs that the uh, different members have made. Uh, indeed, the team is, is hard at work. Uh, in, in the case of the team, the core team that is supporting the committee, they are multitasking. So what we have uh, done, we, we, we try to, to, to beef up uh, the team drawing from other units of parliament uh, since the last time that they made the presentation. We did manage to get a few additional staff members to, to, to reinforce the, 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 the team. In fact, the, the actual nature of work that they, that they have done is, is, is quite huge uh, because they, they, they also do substantive submissions, submissions that are long with, 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 with comments. So at times you can quantify that, but uh, uh, they, they are on top of, of, of their work. We have had the concern that uh, you want the team to, to fast track the process. And that is what we will be trying to do between now and, and, and the end of the year. The process of reinforcing the team is ongoing. Uh, just last week, we received three additional people who are supporting. Uh, they have their primary responsibilities elsewhere, but uh, uh, they they are offering their their 
their spare time to 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 support the project. Uh, so basically, what I'm trying to say is that the the the, the process of reinforcing is, is ongoing. Uh, we keep checking with uh, other managers elsewhere to ensure that uh, where there are uh, staff members with the requisite skills who are underutilized, we request them to redirect the staff members to, to the team. Indeed, between now and, uh, and, and, and the end of the year, the idea will be to improve largely from the 5,000 that has currently been processed towards the, 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 the 18,000 mark uh, we may not reach the 18,000 mark. Uh, the, the, the idea is not so much about quantifying what people are saying. I think uh, some members have highlighted that it's important that the content be the key focus. The, the statistics on who said what, we will have that information uh, available, but the main issue is what uh, the people are saying, the qualitative stuff of what, what they are saying. Uh, maybe in this respect, we can also uh, uh, indicate that uh, we will try to honor the request from some of the members that uh, we, we, we add information on the qualitative aspect, uh, the kind of issues that people raise, the imaging issues pertaining to the sections and the clauses in, in the bill. As, 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 uh, 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 provided by, by, by the stakeholders. We can try and, and do that. Uh, the team is doing very well, but uh, your inputs will actually assist us to reinforce what we, we, we already have. Um, on the issue, I also want to respond on the issue that Honorable, um, I think based on uh, the, 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 the profile of uh, people, of, of stakeholders who have responded to, to the, the submission so far. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on what Honorable Adunz highlighted. Our strat the strategy for the public hearings is, is, is three-pronged. Three the, the idea is to give effect to Parliament's constitutional mandate of facilitating public involvement and in ensuring that there is active, extensive public, that there is an extensive public participation process. How do we do that? Through the pro, three prong strategy. The first one is that is the one that we are currently on of, we have invited the, uh, return submissions from uh, across the country. Um, we, we, we also know that some people expressed interest to, to, to make oral submissions, which brings us to the second phase of the approach. Uh, so that those, those, those stakeholders who have expressed interest will be given uh, uh, the platform to, to, to elaborate on their submissions. And uh, depending on the committee's decision uh, on whether or not people who have not expressed interest should be included, uh, uh, there is a possibility that uh, uh, other members can, uh, of other stakeholders can be added, but that depends on 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 the committee. It's the decision of of the committee. The third phase, which is very critical, and which which attempts to 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 ensure that we have a, a, a broad based uh, uh, um, scenario of stakeholders is uh, the public hearings uh, as uh, some members have already indicated and what you probably already know the idea will be to go throughout the country and visit all the the, the provinces you want to reach people at this at the corner of a small village in a particular province by bringing the, 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 the public hearings closer to where they are in their local municipality 
one of the mechanisms we ensure to uh, uh, we, we 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 employ to ensure that uh, we reach uh, uh, people in the uh, far areas is to transport them. When we visit a particular municipality, we transport up to 200 people from that municipality. So that is a strong mechanism to ensure that uh, everyone is rich by the time you complete the process of, uh, of, of, of public participation. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I, I felt I should raise these issues. Okay. Uh um on the issue of the uh legal people i think it has been answered but also just to remind members that this bill is dpe's bill we are processing the bill of the department and you would remember we had advocate misa and advocate lidwaba um, that presented the, the, the bill to us. Um, also, just to inform members that we lost advocate Lidwaba. I think he's, he's, he's been buried already um, last week, or maybe they they still going to bury him. But advocate Misa, DG, if I'm correct, um, she will be part of us throughout, isn't it? Yeah, I think um, there is a hand of Pumelele. Yes, you can speak. Thank you so much, Chairperson. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm, 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 I'm visible and audible enough. I must apologize, Chairperson. I joined the meeting late because as you can see, I'm in the present. I was in another physical meeting for the Portfolio Committee of Transport. And as soon as I was done there with my presentation, I tried to find a spot so that I can be part of your meeting as well. I apologize for that. Um, as I said, Chairperson, it's Pumelele from Parliamentary Legal Services. And I'm sorry to raise my hand while you were speaking. I just wanted to bring an input which edifies to what has already been said in respect of our role, Chairperson. And generally, as the issue has been raised in respect of human resources capacity, I think for our office as well, that's the same issue. And that is why sometimes we have to be double booked for meetings and we try by all means to do as much as we can and arrange with the committee secretaries that they can accommodate us if maybe there are other matters so that we shift around the meetings. And once the committee, what I wanted to add, Chairperson, just so to bring the committee in context is that now, in terms of the National Assembly rules, we are deep into, into, into rule 286, which so that the members can be clear in being guided on what next and what to do. We are specifically moving on with sub four, 286, four, five, and six. And so when the committee has made the resolutions in terms of how it's going to engage the public, but to get the public awareness and public education must also have happened um, extensively. And that is why I am wondering if the, those offices within parliament have already been engaged because they should be already going into the public or preparing media pamphlets or whatever that may be to bring this bill to the attention of the people. So that, for an example, if the committee has decided that on the three-pronged strategies, they are now going to the public hearings all over the country, then people will already be aware what we are dealing with, what is the content of the bill and where they can access the bill. So that when members go out, to be close to the people and especially on the on the on the issue that has been raised by one member to say are we giving effect to the deep rural people to go and get their views as well other than just enabling those who are already able to access what 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 technology has provided so if public awareness and public education already takes place prior to the members going there it avoids issues where members have to explain why they are there and people raising issues that are unrelated to the bill. So if the processes are in sync, it helps get the outcomes that are looked for 
having eliminated all the issues that may that that may be part of the meetings which are not necessarily part of the meeting so Jefferson I think to to summarize what I'm basically saying is that rule 286 and the Jefferson having said uh, let us now try and make these processes run parallel because I think though the written submissions are important and they've already come in during the processes of deliberations, that's when members would also be looking into what had the public said in their written submissions, what the, had the public said in their oral submissions, and what the, the people say throughout the country when the committee went around, if that would be decided to take the submissions from each and every province. So Jefferson, as this bill is, 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 is highly, um, debatable and there is a lot of interest and because there are lots of people that are affected by it that is why for us as as, as the committee we need to ensure that public engagement is facilitated properly through public awareness as well as being involved with the people and i think the suggestion that the chairperson had already made in the absence to say rather allow the processes to run concurrently so that we do not come at a point where there's an argument that you've taken for two years and you haven't even been to the public, to the to the people, um, and we, 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 we're only sitting with the written submissions. So, Chairperson, I believe the guidance and the processes that are already put in place, they are working towards the outcome where almost every corner of the country will be touched and their their, their voice is heard. And then, when the committee deliberates in terms of what has come out in line with 6D of the rule that I referred to and taking clause by clause changes and influential information that has come in, that is when the bill will then be seen either as differently from what it came as and to what the members would have deliberated on. Lastly, Chairperson, on the issue of um, the, the work done prior to to the committee, to, to the bill coming to the committee and coming to parliament. Yes, sometimes those processes assist to what the executive would have done, but in line with the law and the constitution, the parliament must also engage on its own, even if it duplicates what was done. And in terms of the financial implications and all the other implications in terms of all the social issues, there is a CESA impact report. And I think it's also crucial that the committee gets it so that we know what would be the implications um, uh, 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 as well as know how to deal with them if there are any that are, uh, are impacting on the social issues, including the financial and economic uh, considerations of how this bill will be, will be run out. And to simplify our role, um, unfortunately due to capacity, sometimes you are unable to be part of the public hearings, but if they are virtually done, uh, as COVID has taught us that most can be done, including a virtual platform, we can assist members uh, when, when, when it's indicated and we try and avail ourselves. Uh, but when the committee deliberates clause by clause and is, 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 is now dealing with the extensiveness of the bill, we are present because it is our responsibility to ensure that the amendments and the directives of the committee are given effect to and we do the amendments that have been directed, not doing whatever we wish to do. That is why then it is crucial, especially when the members are deliberating. And we also study the submissions as well when we get them so that we know what was the thinking on the submission and how it impacts on the provision. So that's generally the involvement of the and the role of legal services. But at the end, the, 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 the outcome, um, a list that comes out once members have deliberated to contribute to changing or making better the bill is what we are here to do. And we can't do it unless we are part of the deliberations. That is why we make an attempt either to follow up if we have failed to be part of the meeting or be part of the meeting so that we are clear what was what transpired and what it is that the members are, are deciding must be done. And we make sure that it is done in order to effect the changes on the bill. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, um, Advocate Mister. 
Um, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson, and good morning to Chairperson and Honorable Members and officials on the platform. Chairperson, uh, in the absence of DG's response, I would like to indicate that as legal and legislative services of the department, we will 100% uh, avail ourselves to support the Portfolio Committee uh, with the Bellabar. Thank you, Chairperson. Okay, good. So we, 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 we then responded to the issue of the, um, of the legal people. Um, and I think they have spoken themselves. So legally we are fine um, moving forward. Um, this bill is not going to be, to be reversed. We, we can't reverse it. We are here now. And just to remind members that we have used any, we have used any platform like we have agreed. Every platform there is, we have tried to make sure that parliaments make sure that we reach to everybody in terms of advertising. We used radio stations, we used, um, we used almost everything we could um, to get submissions. We had round one, um, we agreed to extend and then we had uh, round two. So now we are going to to proceed. We are going to to proceed to oral submissions, and then um, after that, we we are going to go for public hearings. Public hearings too are going to identify um, all provinces, and uh, we are going to identify all areas. So meaning we are going to try um, to be there for all the people and be transparent as much as 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 we can. Uh, um, Mr. Bandi, we rely on you for the briefing up of the committee of, of, of the staff members. Um, and we know that you are going to do everything in your power to, to get us more people. But I must also assure members that before we start the, the meetings um, in the morning, we are going to brief members that uh, on the progress. We are going to brief to brief members on the progress of um the processing of the of the of the submission as we proceed before we start a meeting we we will brief uh, members how far we are so it's not a, a matter that is going to 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 happen um under the carpet we are all going to know what is happening but also to take note like we have said that members must understand that we are talking on only 5,000 um, um, submissions now. And uh, like I have said, we are not even at half. So the picture looks like this now. We don't know as we move forward. Um, we have never um, um, dealt with bills as this committee is the first bill. We expect that the, the to, to change that much. As we as we are moving forward, it's fine. I have noticed that all the members, mo or mostly rather, do agree that we must hold um, physical meetings. We we are embarking on that process. Like we have said, members must try. to clear their schedules for the next nine o'clock. As soon as the venue is in communication with all of us to inform where we are going to have these, um, these, um, um, these oral um, submissions. So I think, I think we, every member now is satisfied of where we are and uh, what the, pro, the, 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 the process has been up to this far. And how are we going to 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 move forward? Um, on that note, then um, we should be able to be agreeing that we are closing this matter, and then um, we can release um, other people that uh, are not committee members, so that we deal with the with the issues of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairperson. You are releasing us, Chair. Eh? 
<laughs> what are you now? Are you from DPE? <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, I'm you come doing... late and then you want to be released. Hey, hey, hey. I was just delayed, Chair. Uh, not late, please. Mm -mm. <laughs> okay. I'll let's, lead now, um, let's now look at the BRRR report, members, which is a 98 pager. We'll try to move as fast as we can. Um, it's a bit triple R of the portfolio computer and basic education on the performance of the department uh, for 2021 2022 financial year. Um, it's the introduction, and then um, it's the purpose of the bit triple R, and then there is a role and mandate of the committee, and then there is core functions of the department. Um, functions of the department and then the processes um, that were followed by the committee in arriving at the at the report and then it's the contents of the report to the overview of the key service delivery environment And then the overview of the key relevant policy focus, which is the NTP and what, what state of the nation address, strategic priorities of the department for APP 2021-2022. And then there's the Department of Education response to the 2021-2022 budget review and their recommendations. It's programs of the department, the performance of each um, program, This is the financial um, report and financial performance pay program, the deviations. This is the Auditor General. And it deals with the audit outcome of the department. And we can, okay, these are observations of the committee. And then um, the 
ask some recommendations. It's now the entities and the access recommendations, Malusi and says their financial performances as well. Okay, that's the report, members, which I think it has been sent to yourselves um, on the PRRR process. Um, it has got our um, recommendations on the department, on Umalus and on SAIS, um, as written. Any corrections? No data. Thank you so much, Chair. Chair, the, there's just three points from my side. 
The first one is that there is an indication on Sona remarks there that would be relevant to the committee. And there is no capturing of the mention of the special purpose vehicle and infrastructure, particularly for schools that was announced at Sona. That's the first point. Um, the second one, there was a, a proposal that the department uh, do what we call a research or a study of the previous cohort of a matrix that was 76.4% um, to determine whether those learners have now either joined at the university ranks, uh, they are employed, or some of them may be, may be in the system trying to upgrade. And then um, the last one, Chair, uh, is that there are questions that were submitted to Umalusi and says that have not come back understandably so you know we had the challenge of load shedding and so on but obviously it needs to be recorded somewhere somehow that there was responses that were waited for as was the case in the report that the agsa had to send a few things of which um, the agsa has done so so i do think that there's just those three points just need to find expression in the in the report chair otherwise the report uh, as is is fine but we, we will reserve our right thanks Okay. Um, okay. I think we have taken note of what we have you have you have raised um, as part of the as part of you correcting the report. In the absence of any other corrections, can we adopt the report? Chair, I'm moving. My name is Tebu Kholiti. I'm moving for the adoption. Thank you very much. Any seconda at once? I second the report as it is, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Chair, please note that we are reserving our right on the report so that that is noted when it does go to the House. Thanks. No, it's fine. Like I have said, we have noted your corrections in the report and the issues that we have we have raised. You have raised. Um, thank you very much. Can we then move to the minutes? These are the minutes of the 18th of October. We had a meeting on Zoom uh, where we were briefed by the department on the BRRR Umalusi and SAIS. Uh, page one is the attendance, and page two of the department as well, of Umalusi, of SAIS, parliamentary staff, and the introduction. There, we have opened the meeting, and it was moved by Honorable Murat Setla and supported by Honorable Suela. And then we had briefings of the annual report. We were firstly briefed by the department in the morning. And at three, we were briefed by both um, Omalusi and SAIS. And then um, we have considered and adopted the minutes of the 11th of October. And then, um, we thanked the members for valued contribution to the engagement with the department and entities. We have also mentioned uh, much work that has been done in respect of the Bella Bill submissions. And we also saying we are waiting for the report from the secretariat, which will be shared by the committee in due course, which was done today. And then we attended the meeting on 1926. So basically, this minutes confirm what we have just updated, unfolded um, in that meeting. Can we adopt these minutes? Honorable at once. I'm all there to adopt the minutes. Thank you. Any seconder? Any second to adopt the minutes? 
sorry, Chair, it's myself, Lucia, I second. Thank you very much. The last set of meetings of minutes, Llewellyn. This was the meeting held on the 25th of October, um, where we had a briefing from Umalusi and the department on the examination readiness. Page one is the attendance and page two. And page three, page four, we have opened the minutes and it was moved by Honorable at once and adopted by Honorable Suela. We had remarks from the deputy minister of the department. And then we had the presentation which was done by Dr. Polia, Ms. Weston, and Ms. P. Okubanjo on the exam readiness. And then uh, we had a presentation from Omalusi, which was done by Ms. Matalane. And then these were our um, observations and questions. And these were responses from both the department and Uma Lucy. <laughs> And we concluded the meeting, um, which was chaired by Honorable Adwans. And then she concluded the meeting. And then there was a consideration at of date of the minutes of the 18th. And then the meeting adjourned at quarter to two. Any corrections? Can you switch off your Honorable Suela? In the absence of corrections, can we adopt the minutes? Honorable Adwans. I move to adopt the minutes, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Policia. I, I, I second, thanks. Thank you very much, Honorable Members. Um, we are going to be meeting next. Any communication with regards to the venue and any other additional uh, information that you might be needed will be sent to yourself by the committee secretary. On this note, we are closing the meeting and thank you very much. Thank you very much honorable members for for being part of this meeting. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.